The Romance of the Ranchos. Los Angeles, 1854. First stage crosses San Fernando Pass. Wilmington, 1858. New seaport founded on Dominguez Ranch. Wilmington, 1862. Explosion of boat kills travelers. The Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles presents The Romance of the Ranchos, a weekly dramatization of the highlights of history which make the colorful background for our Southern California of today. Each week, our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, returns to tell another true story of the days of the dawn. Tonight's program is the first of the Romance of the Ranchos broadcast at this, our new time. If you have friends who have been listeners at our old time, 6 o'clock Wednesday evenings, or friends who you think would enjoy these programs, whether previously listeners or not, you may do both them and the sponsors a favor by reminding them of this new hour for Romance of the Ranchos. And you will do a service to the nation by reminding everyone to buy defense bonds and stamps. And by making this investment in victory yourself as frequently and systematically as you can. And now here to tell us the story is our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham. Buenas noches, senoras y senores. Tonight, our story is concerned with a man who stands out as one of the great pioneers of Southern California. A man whose work helped to make possible the fast and early growth of the Southland into a great modern center of commerce and industry. He might be called the father of early transportation here, and he was the founder of the great port of Wilmington. Let's listen to the story of Phineas Banning, a story rich in the romance of the ranchos. <laughs> Phineas Banning was born on a Delaware farm in 1830, son of a family who were among the earliest English settlers of Delaware. Although his father was one of the early graduates of Princeton University, Phineas had a limited education when, at the age of 14, he decided to plunge into the world of affairs. So he left the farm to work in his brother's law office in Philadelphia. But he soon tired of the musty law files and sought a job as a clerk in a mercantile store. Already, the youngster had grown-up ideas, and a lot of self-respect. So, young fellow, <clears throat> you want a job in my store, huh? Think you can sell merchandise? Why, why of course, Mr. Plum. Hmm. Well, I'll give you a try. You say your name is Banning, huh? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Phineas Banning. Hmm, that's a mighty big name for such a young fellow. What do they call you, uh, Phineas? No, sir. I'm Phineas Banning, and that's what I'm called. Do they call you Bertie? What? Why, of course not. Uh, no, they call you Albert, because you're more respectful. Well, that's why I'm called Phineas. I may be young, but I'm able to make my way like any man. And what's more, I'm going to become somebody, do big things. Someday, Phineas Banning will be a big name. And that's me, Phineas Banning. <laughs> Well, one so young... Phineas prospered at his new job. And it was some years later when he was entrusted with a job for an important customer. Oh, there. Uh, how's that, Mr. Claiborne? Fine, fine, Mr. Benning. That'll do quite well for that box. Now we'll start on this other big one. Uh, this is pretty valuable crockery, isn't it, sir? I hate to think of how much money is represented here. That's why we have to be so careful. Oh, I don't think we have to worry about this stuff now. I don't either. You're doing a fine job of packing. In fact, Mr. Benning, you've handled this whole thing very well. Very well, indeed. Well, thank you, sir, but we're very glad to be of service. You know, I've been thinking. I could use a young fellow like you. And besides, I need someone to come along with me and look after the shipment. Would you be interested? Oh, well, it's kind of you, but I'm pretty well satisfied right here. 
Uh, where are you taking this to, uh, New York? No, sir, not by a long ways. 3,000 miles in the other direction. That's another reason why it has to be so carefully packed. This crockery is going overseas, across the Isthmus of Panama and out to California. Holy suffering catfish. You mean all the way out to the Pacific coast? That's right. It would make a right nice trip, and there's plenty of interesting work and good living to be had out there, if you'd want to stay. Oh, say, that's different. California? Oh, gosh. Would you like to go? All you have to do is say the word. Gosh, would I, Mr. Claiborne? Why, any young fella would jump at a chance like that. When do we leave? <laughs> and so, in 1851, Phineas Banning found himself on a ship bound for the promised land of California. En route, his companion and employer died, leaving this 21-year-old boy to deliver his valuable goods at San Pedro. And also, leaving him stranded 3,000 miles from home without a job. There was only one thing to do, and young Phineas was not a man to waste time. Quickly, he obtained a position with the commission agents he met on the beach at San Pedro. Within a short time, he was working with the firm of Temple and Alexander, who handled much of the shipping which passed through the natural harbor at San Pedro. His integrity, his initiative, and drive soon won him the admiration of his employers. And when a decision was about to be made, he was called in. Come in. Oh, it's you, Phineas. Come in, come in. You uh, sent for me, Mr. Alexander? Uh, yes, Phineas, I did. I wanted to tell you that there are going to be some changes around here. Well, you don't mean that my work hasn't been satisfactory? Oh, goodness, no. I didn't mean to imply anything of that kind. No, your work has been excellent. And both John and myself are convinced that you're an up-and-coming youngster. Well, well, thank you, sir. I'm glad you feel that way. And the changes I spoke of are these. First, John, that is Mr. Temple, has decided to give up his share of the business. So, since I don't want to carry on alone, there'll be a new partner in the firm. A new manager. Oh, well, that's fine, but why do you tell me, sir? <laughs> because you're it, Phineas. That is, if you want to be. What? You mean that... Oh, Mr. Alexander, <laughs> do I? All right, son. But if we're going to be partners, there'll be no more of this Mr. Alexander business. From now on, it's David. And together, you and I are going to do all right. <laughs> Phineas Banning took over John Temple's interest in the company, and so started a partnership which was to last long and bring profit to both men. With this as a start, Phineas Banning grew to become one of the most important men in the Southern California of his day. And the name of Phineas Banning was spread throughout the whole of the growing Southland by the stage lines he established. Stage lines which carried passengers from the ships at San Pedro up to Los Angeles in hair-raising races against those of his rivals. Banning was a visionary, always looking for new fields to conquer. When Fort Tejon was established high in the mountains north of the San Fernando Valley, Banning and Alexander decided to try a stage line to the fort, even though there was no road over the steep slopes. And it was Banning himself who took the first stage up. Oh, all right. Jim, come. Oh, there, boy. Well, here we are. Who said we couldn't make the summit of San Fernando Pass? Ooh, Phineas, let's turn around and go back. We'll never make it to the home. Oh, what are you talking about, David? Of course we will. But this is too tough. No road, just an old Mexican pack trail. Difficult enough for a pack mule. Where any pack mule can go, Banning and Alexander's stages will go. David, I'm surprised you wanting to give up. Ah, Phineas, it's only good common sense. People were right. Everybody said this was an impossibility. You couldn't even find a driver who'd try and had to do it yourself. Oh, they were all just scared, that's all. Yeah, they've got some sense, you mean. David, they all said we couldn't get this far, to the top of San Fernando Pass. But we did it. We're here. After a trip, I'll never forget. Why we aren't dead, I don't know. But from here on, the going is even tougher. Now, look. Just look at where the trail leads now. Have you taken a look at that cliff you're supposed to go down? Uh, yeah. It's quite a drop, isn't it? Quite a drop, my man. It's almost impossible to keep your footing on it, let alone take a conquered stage and six horses down. I'll make it. Oh, no, you won't. I own a part of this, and I forbid you to risk my property. We're turning around here. Oh, now, David, calm down. Think what this will mean to our business. We've got to keep on. Ah, Phineas, it's our lives that we're taking chances with. You can never get this stage down that great without killing yourself and us. Oh, yes, I can. I'll take care of myself. And as for you and the passengers, 
You're not going with me. You can walk down, and I'll meet you at the bottom. Uh, here we go. I'll meet you at the bottom, Dave. Get up. Here he is. Wait. Have a nice walk. Holy smokes. Look at that. He's going down. Look. Look, he's skidding all over the trail. Why, the, the stage is ahead of the horses half the time. Oh, Penny is you fool. He'll never make it. Look, look. He's out of control. He's going to crash. He's crashed. Come on, men. Hurry. Just look at it. What a crash. Here, he's over here. Penny is... Phineas, are you all right? Oh, well, uh, uh, sure. Sure, I'm all right. Uh, you see, David? What do you mean, you see? I got her down. Maybe not all in one piece, but she's down the grade. We took a stage over San Fernando Pass. <laughs> Phineas Banning was a man who knew no obstacles. And in spite of a bad wreck on the first run, soon Banning's stages were making the trip to Tahoe regularly. And the fame of Phineas Banning grew. He had big ideas. In 1858, he was talking about something entirely new. Just what I need. I'm going to found a new town, David. Yes, sir. New San Pedro. Oh, but why, Phineas? There's already San Pedro. I know, but you've got to look ahead. This section is going to grow and grow fast, David. Already plenty of people are coming here from the east. Lots of new towns are going to go up, and we can get in on the ground floor. But why here? People want farming land, not this low beach land. But don't land. you understand? Los Angeles is going to be a big city. There's going to be trade and lots of it. The ships of the world will stop here. This is going to be a big harbor. Yeah, maybe, but it looks to me like San Pedro's already the port. They can handle all the shipping there is now. Gosh, man, this harbor hasn't even begun to develop yet. Later on, you're going to see this whole harbor dredged and rebuilt. And as for San Pedro, my new San Pedro is going to back it off the map even now. Now, look, you see this inlet here? Well, that's going to be the new port. God, Phineas, it's not deep enough to float a ship. No, of course not. The ship will anchor out in the bay, just as they do now. But the small boats will bring the goods here instead of to San Pedro. Why? Well, don't you see? Because this shortens the trip to Los Angeles by six miles. Our wagons and stages can cut at least one hour off the time into town. Well, why, say, that's right. That'd give us a real advantage. Well, now you see what I mean? Yes, yes, of course. All right, then. As far as I'm concerned, the town of New San Pedro is only a matter of time. On September 25th, 1858, freight and passengers were landed for the first time at San Pedro, Newtown. Banning steam tug towed the loaded barges up the inland, and a new port was born. Blocks were laid out. Various prominent citizens of the Southland bought sections, including Benjamin D. Wilson, John G. Downey, Manuel Dominguez. And then the town got a new name. Well, sir, it's this way. We figured we sort of needed a new name. Distinctive. Different from San Pedro. Everybody seemed to think I should have my choice in names because the town was my idea, I guess. So I decided on the name of the town near where I was born in Delaware. Wilmington. And that's it. Yes, that was it. The town was rechristened Wilmington, and its growth continued. For a while, it shared the business with San Pedro. But in 1859, with the establishment of Camp Drum and the drum barracks at Wilmington, the new port forged ahead. During the Civil War, all the army supplies were handled through Banning's landings, and prosperity hit. In addition, Banning and Alexander had a profitable trade with the Mormons of Salt Lake and a teeming lumber business in Los Angeles. Those were lush days. Phineas Banning built a beautiful three-story mansion for his family in Wilmington. It may still be seen there, standing in a public park. But he was not satisfied with his already great achievements. He still had ideas far beyond what was dreamed for the Southland in those days. He was still interested chiefly in transportation. And in 1860, when he heard about the new steam wagon... Yes, sir, Dave. It's a wagon without horses. Runs on steam. It sounds crazy to me. Crazy or not, over in Leeds, England, where they made it, they found that it will pull 85 tons. What? <laughs> That's unbelievable. Oh, but think, man, what that'll mean to our business. Think how much more freight we can haul at one time. Yeah, that's right. Well, what do you plan to do? Well, it's on its way over to San Francisco now. A copper company has bought it. 
And I'm going to buy it from them. But, Phineas, it'll cost a lot of money. Sure it will, but what of it? Los Angeles is going to be the first city on the coast to have a steam wagon. When news of Banning's purchase reached Los Angeles, excitement ran high. The population waited impatiently for their first glimpse of the marvelous invention. When word came that it had arrived in San Pedro, crowds waited for its appearance. But they were doomed to disappointment. No, it's no use, David. It just won't work. Well, it does seem to run. I know, but what good's that? It won't haul any freight. None, I guess, except as a curiosity. Except as an example of Banning's folly, you mean? Well, it's not your fault. I know, and I'm not worried. I'll keep right on looking for a way to bring new ideas to Los Angeles. Someday, this is going to be a great country, David. And I'd like to help make it. Phineas, in spite of anything the rest of us can do about it, you will. You'll bring us progress whether we want it or not. And more power to you. Most people never question the value of life insurance or insurance against damage or theft of a car. But many people, when buying a home, do not recognize that title insurance is just as important as a protection against the loss of that home. Some disregard the possibility of a defect in their title, which could mean that their home might be taken away from them without any payment whatsoever. Others suppose that they, with little or no legal knowledge, can examine the records themselves and establish the validity of their title in spite of the fact that this would require weeks and months to go through the files of over 50 public offices. But the wise homeowner knows that for a relatively small cost, he can obtain protection by taking out a policy of title insurance from the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles. Trained title examiners will go over the record of his property all the way back to the earliest days. They will check the possibilities of forgeries and many more hidden defects which might jeopardize his ownership of the land. And once they've decided that he has a good title to the land and issued their policy of title insurance, he will be paid the full amount of any loss he suffers up to the face amount of the policy in case some defect covered by the policy should later be found. Then he can be secure in the knowledge that his investment is protected. Phineas Banning's business dealings prospered for the most part, in spite of an occasional reverse such as the steam wagon deal. But in 1862, he suffered a serious loss. He was aboard his beautiful little steamer, the Ada Hancock, which carried passengers from the wharf at Wilmington to the ships waiting in the bay. Standing at the rail, he was talking to a friend. Well, Mr. Banning, the bay looks rough today. Yeah, it is. Quite a wind chopping it up. When we leave the inlet and hit the open water, we'll know it all right. On the last trip, that first wave gave us quite a thump. Well, I hope I don't get seasick. Oh, no, it's not far out to the senator. And that ship's big enough to weather this easily. Just these little boats that make you sick. Well, we've certainly got good company. Many of the most important people in Los Angeles are aboard. Yeah, we have a full load, all right. Sit. Take a good grip on the rail. Here we come into the open water. Yeah, and it's going to be a bad one. Why doesn't he head her around more? Hey, Joe! Joe, head her in. We're going to hit broadsides. Hey, those waves are big. Look out! Here it comes! <laughs> Phineas, we're tipping over. Oh, we'll come back up. There's water pouring over the side. Oh, Lord, if that cold water gets to the boilers. Oh, oh, Phineas, Phineas, help. Phineas, Phineas, help. Grab my head. Hey, oh, oh, no, no, you'll be all right. I landed on the sandbar. Just give me your hand off. I'll pull you up. Oh, that's it. Oh, there you are. Oh, Lord. Oh, good Lord, what happened, Phineas? I can't quite grasp it yet myself. The boilers blew up. Where? Where's the boat? Blown to bits down to the water line. Come on, there's still some people in the water. We've got to help them. Yes, but, but what about all the others? They're gone. They're past help. Come on. Grim tragedy hit Banning as the explosion of the Ada Hancock claimed the lives of at least 26 persons. But he escaped miraculously uninjured. As time went on, Phineas returned to his old dream of furnishing a new method of transportation for the Southland. Only this time, he proposed a railroad from Wilmington to Los Angeles, and he ran into objections. A railroad from Los Angeles to San Pedro and Wilmington? Ha, oh, you're crazy. There wouldn't be enough freight for two trains a month. We'll fill more than two a day. And this town hasn't even started to grow yet. 
Within a few years, it'll be 50 a day. You're dreaming, Phineas. And I don't mind your dreaming just so you don't ask the county to foot the bill. Here you want us taxpayers to put up the bonds for this road that we don't need. Bah! It'll bankrupt the county. It'll do nothing of the kind. It'll be the biggest boost this section has ever known. It'll make Los Angeles and its harbor one. It'll bring an uh, inland city right down to the water. Well, if you expect my support for such a crazy scheme, you'll have another thing coming. I value my pocketbook and that of my fellow taxpayers too much. We'll stop it. I don't think so, sir. Because I'm a good fighter when I get started. And believe me, I'm started. The Los Angeles and San Pedro Railroad is only a matter of time. Once more, Phineas Banning made that prediction. And once more, he was right. He even got himself elected to the California legislature to fight his fight on its floors. Slowly, opposition was overcome. The legislature was won, but the people had to be converted to the idea of putting up the necessary money. In March of 1868, an election was held. Banning received the news. Phineas. Phineas, they've done it. They've done it. What? You mean they've they voted for the railroad. It was close, but they did it. 704, 672 against. Oh, thank goodness. Now we can go ahead. We'll get started laying the tracks right away. A year later, the first trains ran from Wilmington to Los Angeles. And within a few years, Phineas Banning's boast came true. And 50 trains a day were hauling the freight of the port. But for Banning, there was little triumph in the completion of the railroad. For soon after... Phineas, you don't mean to tell me that you're going to sell everything. Your interest in the railroad, the wharves, everything. I have to, Dave. I've sunk so much money in this mining business down in Sonora... I've taken a terrific loss. But that doesn't mean you have to sell. Just hang on and you'll be all right. No, I have to have money. That's the only way I can raise it. Oh, but why? Your credit's good if you need money. No, Dave, you don't understand. My friend Tishner put his money into the mines, too, on my say-so. Now that our money's gone, I'm not going to let him stand the loss. I'm going to pay him back every cent he lost. But, Phineas, that's crazy. He knew the risk. He took a legitimate business chance. He came in on my say-so. That's enough for me. I'm going to pay him back every cent. And so Banning lost most of his holdings. But it didn't discourage him. He still came up with plans and ideas. And one of them took him to Washington in 1871. There he talked to a senator. So, Mr. Banning, you've come all the way from California to get us to improve your little harbor of San Pedro. Huh? It's not a little harbor, Senator. It's one of the world's best harbors. It could be. And it's the port of what will one day be one of America's greatest cities, Los Angeles. Well, you may be right, but that looks a long way off. Perhaps it will be. If you gentlemen don't help us improve it. Oh, come, come now. You mean this little breakwater you want will do all this? No, but it's a start. It'll mean that a channel will be created deep enough for some pretty good-sized ships to come right up to the wharves. Instead of anchoring out in the bays, they do now. And why, may I ask, are you so anxious to see this done? Are you in business there? I have been. I might be again. Uh -huh. This naturally would help my business and all my friends' business. But more than that, I want to see that wonderful country grow as it should. I want to live to see it the most progressive section of our nation. And I think I will. Well, I admire your enthusiasm, sir. Well, maybe we can help you. At least from now on, I'll be on your side. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Thank you. And with his boundless enthusiasm and good sense, Phineas Banning won federal support for improvement of the harbor of San Pedro and Wilmington on a trip across the country paying his own expenses. For his great contributions to the growth of the Southland, he was honored in 1872 by appointment as a brigadier general of militia. And although he never served in combat, Banning was proud of his title. Now he saw a chance to get back into business in Wilmington as the Southern Pacific took over the Los Angeles to San Pedro Railroad. From them... Manning bought some small boats and warehouses with borrowed money. And soon, he was once more the thriving businessman. But he was aging now. And more and more, he left the business in the hands of his sons. It was one day in 1885 on a visit to San Francisco that... So, uh, this is one of those cable cars I've heard about, eh? Yes, General Banning. It's remarkable how she climbs right up these steep hills, isn't it? Yeah, it's mighty fine. I've always been interested in transportation myself, you know. 
But this is something I never thought of. <laughs> well, this is about the end of our ride. We'll get off the next street. <laughs> All right. All right, step down, General. Here, let me give you a hand. Oh, nonsense, I'm doing all right. Uh, uh, look out, General, you're stepping right in front of that wagon. Huh? What'd you say? General, look out! General! Injured by a heavy wagon which knocked him down, the great six-foot-two frame of Phineas Banning was stretched out upon a hospital bed never to rise again. And on March the 5th, 1885, General Phineas Banning died. The Southland mourned one of its most public-spirited citizens, one of its most progressive leaders and creative minds. He's been called the father of Los Angeles Harbor Improvement and the father of the Southland's transportation systems. And, of course, he was the father of the great port of Wilmington, which has today grown into even greater stature than he had visioned for it. And this success story of the youngster from the Delaware farm is typical of the chapters from the progress of Southern California, rich in the romance of the ranchos. Title insurance service is not the kind of commodity which can be bought and sold over a counter with price as the primary consideration. The protection which prompt, accurate title insurance service gives to those who deal in real property is worth far more than the cost which is attached to it. However, it is well worth knowing that the insurance which the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles gives to its customers is available at rates that are substantially lower than the average cost of such service elsewhere. Title insurance is something which you may purchase only once or twice in a lifetime. It means peace of mind and security of your investment in real property. The Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles, through the years of business integrity, has established a reputation which will bear your most rigid scrutiny. Frank, what's the story for next week? Next Sunday, we take you to the land around El Monte, land which once was the great Rancho San Francisquito, and bring you the story of the battles over its ownership. It's a story that's interesting and exciting, so don't miss it. Until next Sunday night, then, this is your wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, saying, Hasta la vista, señoras y señores. Romance of the Ranchos, a presentation of the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles, featuring Frank Graham as the wandering vaquero, is dramatized by John Dunkel and produced by Ted Bliss, with special music arranged by Gaylord Carter. Bob Lamont speaking and saying good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.